Okay, so it's uh, 12 o'clock and we're ready to begin our webinar. I know there's a number of people that are still entering the meeting, but uh, they'll be able to blend right in as we start. So um, on behalf of DLZ, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. My name is Steve Metzer and I'm a senior planner and ADA compliance specialist with DLZ. I've been assisting clients with a wide variety of ADA compliance projects, including a number of ADA self-evaluations and transition plans over the past decade or more. This is the second in our ADA series of webinars, with the first one in May being on the first two chapters of the 2010 ADA Standards for Accessible Design. And we also did another seminar during the pandemic on transitioning to video public meetings. Today we're switching gears a little bit and talking about the current guidelines for pedestrian facilities within the public right-of-way to be referred to throughout today's webinar as PROWAG. Facilities within the public right-of-way are important for pedestrians and definitely an important part of your ADA compliance obligations. Some house cleaning things before we begin. For those of you using Zoom on a computer, you'll see at the bottom of the window a couple of important icons. If you're using Zoom on a smartphone or tablet of some kind, your controls will be different, but they're certainly there somewhere. First is the closed captioning or live transcript button, which will display my spoken words into visual text if you need that accommodation or are in a loud location. You can turn the captioning on and off simply by clicking on the icon. Second is the Q&A icon. If you have a question you would like me to address at the end, please type it in here. Please, we ask that you do not use the chat or raise hand options, as those will not be monitored today given the large number of attendees. It will help when asking your question to give me the slide number that your question pertains to if you want me to refer back to a slide. The slide number can be found in the lower right-hand corner of every slide, as shown here on slide two. While the webinar is scheduled for and the presentation will last approximately one hour, I will stay on after the presentation to respond to as many questions as I can and as long as there are still participants online. The webinar is being recorded and the video will be made available to you after it is processed. A PDF of today's presentation slides can also be made available, so please don't feel the need to screenshot or take photographs of slides. So sit back and here we go. Today's webinar will begin by briefly reviewing the history of ADA right-of-way guidance which goes all the way back to the 1991 ADA guidelines, which really don't work for the right-of-way very well. I'll then focus on the scoping and technical provisions of the ProWay guidelines and reference standards, primarily on curb ramps and sidewalks, but we'll touch on most of the other right-of-way facilities. I will include discussion on some of the most common areas of noncompliance, some common errors and challenging situations and likely and potential solutions. And finally, we will have an uh, time at the end for questions and answers, as I mentioned earlier. Since we do have time restrictions today, I have to draw a line somewhere for some items, which results in limitations on what can be presented. Nothing that's presented today should be considered as legal advice. The information presented is my interpretation of PROAG based on uh, working with the guidelines extensively, uh, numerous discussions with Access Board staff, and attendance at a wide variety of presentations by both the Access Board and others, including at the National ADA Symposium. Also, while some photos or situations presented may resemble a situation in your particular location, there are likely to be enough differences uh, in some of the specifics. So please don't think that every item or situation discussed directly applies to your situation because it probably doesn't. We have an audience today from many different states and the requirements in some states may vary. Some entities have modifications to the guidelines and we won't discuss anything unique to any specific state or local requirement. Last, for topics that we are covering, there are some provisions and advisory information we simply cannot review due to time constraints. So be sure to become familiar with these by reviewing the pro -A guidelines on your own at your leisure. Note that I will not be covering anything in detail on transit facilities in the right-of-way or passenger loading zones in the right-of-way, which while important where they are present, are less common types of facilities uh, for most of our clients. And I won't be covering anything about the different options for collecting and analyzing the right-of-way data as part of an ADA self-evaluation and transition plan if you're affiliated with a local unit of government. 
There are many options available and I would be happy to discuss those with any of you individually after today's webinar. So first, let's discuss who are the disabled pedestrians using the public right-of-way that we need to accommodate. Well, the easy answer is all of them, but the primary groups that have the most difficulty when facilities are not compliant are those that are non-ambulatory and utilize a wheelchair, persons who are ambulatory but have limitations and may use a mobility device such as a walker or cane, persons with low vision, and persons that are blind. While there are others that we certainly need to be concerned about, these four groups are most likely to make up the vast majority of the disabled pedestrians using the right-of-way and seem to be the focus of the PROAG guidelines. Note that in some cases, accessibility requirements for one group may conflict with the best accommodations for another, and a compromise had to be made during development of the guidelines. For example, wheelchair, cane, and walker users typically dislike the truncated domes required at all curb ramps but they are an essential non-visual cue for the blind or low vision pedestrians that, are, that they are entering a non-pedestrian area. A primary purpose for development of PROAG and the other ADA requirements is to ensure that facilities, including those within the public right-of-way, are accessible. All the different facilities need to be continuous and connecting to provide that accessibility. As you can see on this photograph of a fairly typical downtown area in a small town, the continuity of the sidewalk in this case is not without some minor or at least some potential complications, including things like tree grates, outdoor dining areas, and park bicycles, but for the most part is fairly continuous. All these different facilities also need to be safe and not be an afterthought. Here you can see a sidewalk in another small town that allows outdoor dining. No consideration was given to the fact during the approval of this that the only level 48 inch wide portion of the sidewalk is that which is closest to the building. During the summer this only level area is blocked by the fencing requiring all pedestrians including those with disabilities to go around it onto the section of sidewalk that is not level and near the adjacent on-street parking. The section of sidewalk is also barely 48 inches wide and can easily be obstructed or have protrusions when a vehicle with large mirrors parks at the curb. Right-of-way facilities need to also be maintained. Issues like cracking sidewalks and other issues need to be addressed to allow those facilities to remain accessible. In some areas, like here in Michigan where I'm based, snow removal is important to ensure access, especially in winter. Snow often obstructs many of the right-of-way facilities used by pedestrians and can often be impassable to those with disabilities. Few people think about temporary obstructions, but they can also be a significant barrier for disabled pedestrians. Traversing a beautiful compliant sidewalk isn't possible when someone has parked a vehicle across it or there are bikes, trash and recycling containers, and other obstructions placed, even if only for short periods of time. Many communities do have ordinance that prohibit obstructing the sidewalk. However, the focus should be on education first, with enforcement being a last resort for those who continue to be out of compliance if necessary. The consequence for disabled pedestrians of not having reliably compliant right-of-way facilities and have those be accessible is for them to use the street. Even where the sidewalk and curb ramps look to be accessible, the experience of some users of obstructed or dead-end sidewalks often results in them taking the less safe alternative of riding in the street, knowing that at least there they will not be obstructed or blocked. In the winter, with accumulation of snow and ice both on the pedestrian access route, sidewalks, curb ramps, and other facilities, as well as in the streets, that snow and ice may end up restricting some of these individuals from having to stay home because it's unsafe for them to travel. Let's talk now briefly about the history of right-of-way guidance in this country. The history of guidance on ADA and the right-of-way started way back in 1991, 20 years ago, 22 years ago, with the ADA Accessibility Guidelines, or ADAG, which really apply best to buildings and sites and was modeled after the Architectural Barriers Act standards for federal buildings. It was recognized early on that ADAG really didn't address the right-of-way very well so the U.S. Access Board established a special advisory committee for public rights of way that, can, that worked on guidance to specifically address 
the pedestrian facilities within the public right of way. That committee began rulemaking in 1999, publishing their initial recommendations in 2000 and submitting a report to the Access Board in 2001. Those draft guidelines were put out for public notice in June of 2002, with the Access Board receiving over 1,400 comments during the comment period. The committee went back to work going through the comments and addressing them as needed and issued a second draft of the guidelines in November of 2005, which included an analysis of the cost of implementation of those guidelines. The 2005 guidelines didn't advance through the approval process, but the committee was committed to developing a set of right-of-way standards. They continued to work on improving the 2005 guidance, eventually leading to the July 2011 issuance of the proposed accessibility guidelines for pedestrian facilities in the public right-of-way, or PROWAG, which is the most current version out there today. This document was put out for public notice in February of 2012, with again, over 600 comments received. The Access Board went on to issue in 2013 a supplemental notice of proposed rulemaking to address shared use paths, which were not included in the July 2011 version of PROAG. As it stands today, PROAG has not been adopted by any federal agency. That makes the 2010 ADA standards the enforceable standard, but PROAG is considered best practice and utilized for right-of-way facilities by most agencies. In fact, the Federal Highway Administration issued a memo in J January of 2006, noting that PROAG is the recommended best practice and state of the practice for areas not fully addressed by ADAG, or now ADA Standards of Accessible Design from 2010. If you're interested in additional details about the history of PROAG, you can find it in both the preamble in the PROAG document and also on the Access Board website at the web address shown on this slide. PROAG is much more concise than the ADA standards, being only four chapters rather than the 10 that comprise the standards for buildings and parks. Chapter one of PROAG includes the application and administration provisions, which I'll elaborate on here in a second. Chapters two and three include the various scoping and technical requirements respectively, and I'll go over many of those in detail later today. And chapter four, which includes the, the supplementary technical requirements, which really just address some of the requirements for a variety of items within the right-of-way that are also commonly found outside of the right-of-way for things like protruding objects, reach ranges, clear spaces, ramps, signage, and whatnot. So chapter one includes some of the important provisions that we need to discuss, um, which includes the obvious purpose, which is ensuring that pedestrian facilities within the right-of-way need to be readily accessible and usable by pedestrians, including those with disabilities. First is the equivalent, equivalent facilitation provision in R102, which basically states that if you can provide substantially equivalent or greater accessibility than that which is required by the use of alternative designs, products, and technologies, you can do so. As with the building standards for ADA, proving that equivalent facilitation is on you. So you certainly need to document what you do and why and how you think it uh, results in equivalent or greater accessibility. Chapter one also includes a figure uh, for conventions, which is shown here on the slide, which gives you all the different dimensions, units of measurement, and other features used in the document and what they mean. Chapter one also incorporates other standards by reference, primarily the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices or MUTCD, which is reference for items such as pedestrian push buttons and traffic signals, as well as pedestrian detour routes. Last, this chapter includes definitions for various terms that are used throughout PROAG. Um, but unlike the ADA standards, it does not carry those definitions in italics throughout the document for the defined terms. As we go forward, a couple of important definitions I do want to touch on briefly uh, to ensure that we are all on the same page there. Um, it's important as we move forward to know the difference between the required 48 inch minimum width pedestrian access route or PAR and the rest of the sidewalk, which comprises the pedestrian circulation path, or I usually refer to it more as the pedestrian circulation area. Um, 
if you have an eight foot wide sidewalk, only 48 inches of that sidewalk would need to meet the requirements and be considered the pedestrian access route. All other areas of that eight foot sidewalk outside of that continuous 48 inch width pedestrian access route would comprise the pedestrian circulation area. Also, knowing what qualifies as right of way and a shared use path. Shared use path. Right of way is defined in PROAG as any public land that's acquired for or dedicated to a transportation purpose. So it can include a sidewalk, greenway, linear path, and some other types of uh, multi-use pathways. A shared use path is a route designed not just for pedestrians, but also bicyclists and can be found both within either a highway or road right of way or within an independent right of way, such as a couple that we just talked about um, and uh, former railroad bed used for non-vehicular use. Again, it's important to just uh, make the distinction that just because bicycles can use a sidewalk doesn't make it a shared use path. Chapters two, R2 and R3 of PROAG include the scoping and technical requirements for the different right-of-way facilities and will be the focus of my discussion today, especially the pedestrian access routes and curb ramps and blended transitions. I will go over the others shown here, but in less detail. It's important to note that quite often, especially if considered during design, some of the different facilities can share some common features. For example, a level clear space at a pedestrian signal push button can also be the top landing and turning space for a curb ramp and sidewalk if you plan ahead and they're designed as such. So that's where it's really important to look at all the different requirements for all the different types of facilities and utilize similar areas to minimize the space needed to provide compliant facilities. One of the most important scoping provisions of PROAG to understand is that you are never required to install or construct sidewalks if they're not currently provided adjacent to a road project. Now, before you start looking for that statement verbatim in PROAG, it really isn't stated exactly like that in the guidelines. But in multiple discussions with members of the Access Board and their staff, this is universally agreed upon as not being a requirement. Now, that's not to say that construction of sidewalks where they don't currently exist shouldn't be considered, especially where there's evidence of a high number of pedestrians wearing down a cow path in the grass, like in this slide. But unlike curb ramps, if you are working on a roadway, you do not have to provide or fix the adjacent sidewalk at the same time that you need to fix the roadway. The Federal Highway Administration has issued guidance that curb ramps within the scope of your project and the boundaries of your project do need to be improved when you do a road project or alteration, but not sidewalks. However, that would certainly be a great time to do it when everything's all torn up and you have a contractor there. If there is an existing pedestrian access route, it is required to be accessible to and usable by disabled pedestrians, which goes back to the purpose of PROAG, which really sounds like a little bit of a conflicting provision with the last slide. This is really where your ADA transition plan and other planning documents like pedestrian circulation plans or master sidewalk plans come in. Those types of planning documents assist you in prioritizing improvements for sidewalks given the limited funds typically available and when to determine when you can actually implement those improvements. PROAG, like the ADA standards, recognizes that there are situations for alterations where you just cannot meet all the requirements and does provide that where you have those situations, you need to comply to the extent practicable. Examples of constraints can be things like limited right of way, a signal controller that would be extremely costly to relocate, a utility structure such as a large electrical transmission pole that can't be moved or worked around entirely, or even extreme or unique topography. There's no longer an expectation or more importantly, a requirement to go to the extreme shown on this slide. PROAG also states that during an alteration, you cannot reduce access, such as by removing a sidewalk where there currently is one rather than repair or replace it. There may be instances where an isolated segment of sidewalk could be considered for removal without being replaced, but carefully consider other options before doing so. You might also want to consider reaching out to the Department of Justice or Access Board for their opinion 
about each individual situation before removing those right-of-way facilities. But either way, document your decisions and why you've decided that it would not decrease accessibility. PROAG also requires that you provide an alternate pedestrian access route, which is essentially a pedestrian detour, when there is a construction impacting uh, construction project impacting sidewalks or other right-of-way facilities from being able to be safely used. The detailed technical requirements for signage, barriers, and other things that would make up that alternate pedestrian access route can be found in MUTCD section 6D and 6F. And that's incorporated by reference in PROAG section R205. The pedestrian facilities within the right-of-way are all interrelated and are required to be connected to each other as well as access routes to facilities outside the right-of-way. Pedestrian access routes or sidewalks are the connector between your street crossings and curb ramps. They also provide a connection to transit stops and shelters if you have those in your community. And last, that connection needs to be provided from the public sidewalk to building entrances and other publicly accessible facilities outside the right-of-way, which is a requirement also of the 2010 ADA standards. So that wraps up the scoping requirements for the pedestrian access route. Now on to some of the technical requirements. With regard to width, the most basic requirement for the pedestrian access route is that be a minimum of 48 inches of continuous clear width exclusive of the curb. So when measuring the width of a sidewalk, you would not include the six inch or more width of the top of the curb. If your pedestrian access route is less than 60 inches wide, you're required to provide a passing space every 200 feet that is 60 inches by 60 inches. That passing space can be a small bump out as shown on the photo, as well as the figure above it or sometimes there may be a driveway or parking lot or other feature that can serve the same purpose of allowing two individuals and in, uh, going in opposite directions to pass one another. Unfortunately, the width of pedestrian access routes are oftentimes obstructed by a variety of items and reducing the, the route less than the 48 inches as shown on some of the photos on this slide taken by DLZ's field staff. And, uh, typical examples of obstructions include a wide variety of things such as utility poles, uh, fire hydrants, mailboxes, landscaping, uh, and signs, as well as a number of others. The 48 inch clear width needs to be maintained around all obstructions. Unlike the building standards, there are currently no provisions to allow deviations for a short distance to get around a pole or a tree though there may be some cases where the existing physical constraint scoping provision discussed earlier could be applied. In some situations, you might have right-of-way available or will be able to work with the adjacent property owner to obtain right-of-way or even an easement to get around some of these obstructions. This might be more realistic if your only other option is to remove a healthy tree that the adjacent property owner really likes. They're much more willing to work with you if that's the case. The only other option is to remove or relocate the obstruction. Um, and if in the case of a tree, it would be removing the tree. The entire sidewalk area is not required to meet all of the technical requirements as we talked a little bit about earlier. Only a continuous 48 inch wide minimum width area within the right of way is required for your pedestrian access route. I would refer you back again to the definitions we discussed earlier regarding the differences between the pedestrian access route and the pedestrian circulation area. Often you'll see a sidewalk in a downtown shopping district broken out into different zones that allow different uses. As shown on this slide, only the pedestrian zone, which comprises the 48 inch wide pedestrian access route, is required to meet all the technical requirements for width and slope. The adjacent area must meet some, like you can't have protruding objects, but there are no requirements within the pedestrian circulation area for things like slopes or dimensions. And in some cases, sidewalks don't have a pedestrian circulation area. If your pedestrian access route and street crossing extends to or through a median or a pedestrian refuge island, the width of those is required to be 60 inches minimum. And unlike regular pedestrian access routes designed only for pedestrians, the entire width of that shared use path is required to meet all the requirements. 
This means that an eight foot wide shared use path like shown on this photo is required to have the entire eight foot clear width, clear of obstructions and meet all the slope and other technical requirements of the guidelines. Essentially, the entire shared use path is the pedestrian access route. With regard to grade and running slope, the running slope for pedestrian access routes within the right of way is allowed to be as much as the adjacent street. This is really a significant change from previous versions of ProWag, which recognized the difficulty in attaining a maximum running slope of 5% in many areas within a limited right of way width adjacent to streets with fairly steep topography. While this is something you are able to utilize on your projects, efforts should be made during design to always try to keep the slope as flat as possible to maximize usability for pedestrians with disabilities. Once you get outside the road right of way, including for shared use paths, you're still required to provide a 5% maximum running slope. Often this means utilizing switchbacks or other design features to extend the distance and minimize and flatten that slope. If you're not able to attain a 5% slope still, you may need to consider looking at other options, including ramps with handrails. Note that there are many instances where natural terrain may require you to consider invoking the existing constraint provision that we talked about earlier. If you do this, there are other considerations to think about for pedestrians that are disabled that I would be happy to discuss with any of you offline since each situation is unique. Pedestrian street crossings cannot exceed 5% running slope, which would be rare anyways, unless you were in a super elevated curve or something unusual. There's not really too many street crossings at Daytona Raceway or similar locations. And as with the requirement for width, there is a physical constraint exception for grade, though it seems to be less applicable for grade given the ability to match the slope of the adjacent roadway. For cross slope, the technical requirements are that you have a 2% maximum cross slope, which is per measured perpendicular to the path of travel at the facilities listed on the slide. Note the asterisk next to the street crossings as I will discuss those in further detail in a moment since the 2% maximum does not always apply there. Again, as with width and running slope, only that continuous 48 inch width of the sidewalk needs to meet the 2% maximum cross slope requirement, except for shared use paths, which must be 2% maximum for the full width. I really can't stress enough the importance of compliant cross slopes, which are much more difficult to deal with than running slope in many cases for persons using a mobility device. Steep cross slopes tend to direct wheelchairs and walkers down the slope by gravity, requiring those users to continuously make adjustments and work extremely hard to maintain their path of travel. While a 0% cross slope really is the best for these users, that may not be feasible for drainage, but try to keep the cross slope to a minimum. Now on briefly to street crossings. For crossings with yield or stop control, you cannot exceed the 2% cross slope, just like all the other facilities that we just talked about. Designers are expected to be able to table the intersection on those streets to flatten them out since vehicles cannot drive through unrestricted and would be expected to either stop or yield. For crossings without yield or stop control, which includes signalized and uncontrolled streets, the cross slope can be as high as 5%. Again, this can be an issue for disabled pedestrians with mobility devices being a fairly steep cross slope, but it was a compromise that needed to be made for the safety of motor vehicles. Note that mid-block crossings are not required to meet any cross slope standard and are allowed to equal the slope of the road, even if they are signalized. In most of DLZ's ADA compliance projects, the biggest non-compliant issue that we've identified for sidewalk cross slopes tends to be at driveways. If the continuous requirement of the 2% maximum cross slope for the sidewalk is not considered during construction, driveways are often built through the sidewalk and the interface of the two warped to match, causing a pretty abrupt and sometimes extreme cross slope for the pedestrian at that driveway. In many locations, this design error, error is repeated at numerous driveways on a block, essentially creating a significant and unsafe barrier to access for many disabled pedestrians and can essentially be unusable. <laughs> 
There are some fairly simple design solutions for most driveways, though steep drives can be a problem for vehicles. Those vehicles may bottom out given the transition from slope to flat to slope. And we ran into some of those issues at residential areas in Tennessee where the grades can be very interesting if you've ever visited Eastern Tennessee. The important thing for driveways is to design the sidewalk through the driveway, which may require working with the property owner for a portion of their driveway, which is outside of the right of way to lengthen and flatten the slope, but it certainly works better for them in the long run. Another area that we see cross slope issues uh, is in the downtown area of some older small towns, especially. The original pedestrian access route may have been a raised wooden boardwalk adjacent to a dirt street used originally by horses and wagons. As time passed, the street was paved and the elevation of the buildings had already been set at the level of the wooden boardwalk, which resulted in uh, the improved upgraded sidewalks that were paved uh, having severe cross slopes. I've seen this addressed in a number of ways. Um, one is to use a step curb at the on-street parking, uh, being certain to provide enough depth and the correct height so cars don't scrape their front bumper when parking as shown here in the photographs on the right. Uh, I've seen one, two, or sometimes even three step curbs depending on the grade difference between the parking and the street and the uh, sidewalk with the building entry elevations. Another treatment I, we have seen is to provide two different levels for pedestrians along the pedestrian route with a through lane at curb level and a raised level with stairs and ramps at the level that allows entry into the businesses and other buildings. Your ability to use one of these or other adaptations likely depends on the width of the sidewalk and the, how much available right of way you have. For the option utilizing ramps and stairs, each one of the routes that I described would need to meet the technical requirements for the pedestrian access routes. Since there are two pedestrian access routes, one being the through route and the other the building access route. In terms of surface requirements and materials, all surfaces for pedestrian access routes are required to be firm, stable, and slip resistant. And that would include most improved surfaces such as concrete, asphalt, pavers, wood, and even some compacted aggregates like crushed limestone. For some surfaces like wood or smooth stone, you might need to provide a slip resistant application since they can be slippery when they are wet. Generally speaking, grass, gravel, dirt, wood chips, mulch, and similar types of loose surfaces are not considered as compliant. Vertical displacements can be not only trip hazards for ambulatory people, but also a barrier to wheelchair users. Vertical alignments should generally be flush and not exceed one quarter inch unless beveled and can then be as much as one half inch if beveled properly as shown here on the slide. The most common vertical displacement issues are typically at joints and cracks with shallow tree roots being a common cause, especially in older communities. Often these vertical displacements create not only issues with the requirement for uh, vertical differences in elevation, but also non-compliant running and cross slopes. Where minor displacements are present, you can sometimes grind down the edge as shown here in the photo on the left. You also sometimes see in extreme situations where there are safety hazards, the temporary fix would result in the need to go in and saw cut or remove maybe a section of severely heaved uh, sidewalk and put in patches using things like asphalt to try to smooth out and remove those vertical faces. While this reduces the hazard, it does little to improve accessibility and can still be a significant barrier to access. Horizontal openings can be one half inch minimum or maximum. And if they're elongated, they should be oriented with a short dimension in the direction of the path of travel. These types of openings include things like grates for storm structures and tree grates around landscaping, but can also include separations in sidewalk joints and cracks. In urban areas, these can also include ventilation shafts and covers for lifts and elevators. If over one half inches in width, these openings can trap the wheels of wheelchairs or the legs of walkers and canes. In some cases, you can reduce or eliminate the issue by placing either wire mesh screen over the openings or using straps to reduce their long dimension. 
but you still need to consider the design if the grade is used for stormwater intake. Where your sidewalk provides an at-grade crossing of railroad tracks, the width of the flangeway gap at the rail can be up to three inches for rails used to transport freight. If the track is used for non-freight tra trains, the gap can only be two and a half inches. This is obviously something you would need to coordinate with the railroad, which if you've ever dealt with a railroad uh, about at their right of way, you know how that can go. So that's it for pedestrian access routes. Now let's move on to curb ramps. The most basic scoping provision for curb ramps and blended transitions is that they are required to connect the pedestrian access route to each street crossing served, and they must be contained entirely within the width of the street crossings. The preamble in PROAG references R207 by stating that typically curb ramps must be provided at each street corner. For alterations, PROAG does recognize the potential for constraints that may not allow for a curb ramp crossing for each direction. Noting a single diagonal ramp or depressed corner is permitted in those situations. As with the pedestrian access route, constraints can be a variety of issues, including right of way. All efforts should be made to minimize the use of diagonal ramps. They provide very poor directional cues for blind pedestrians, and they don't provide drivers with good information about which direction the pedestrian is going to cross. The general advisory in R304 recognizes two basic types of curb ramps. The first is perpendicular, which is so named since the direction of the ramp run is perpendicular to the adjacent curb. The advisory notes that perpendicular ramps can be provided where sidewalks are 12 feet minimum width. As we move into curb ramps and blended transitions, I want to ensure everyone understands some of the terms that will be used on upcoming slides. I'm going to assume that most of you know some of these terms, so I won't go over each one of them. But I am going to try to also use color coding on these upcoming slides to demonstrate the different curb ramp features I'll describe. This slide shows again a typical perpendicular ramp with the sloped area of the ramp shown in red and the adjacent curb shown in yellow. You can also see the different pedestrian areas in different shades of blue with the pedestrian access route being the lighter shade of blue and your landing and turning space in green. Note that I'm not going to shade the detectable warning that is required on all ramps, but they will be shown with some type of texture or pattern typically on most graphics. Parallel ramps, as opposed to perpendicular ramps, have the ramp runs parallel to the adjacent curb. The advisory notes that parallel ramps can be provided where sidewalks are four feet minimum width, and that's the same as the minimum pedestrian access route width. Remember this key fact for later when compared to the 12 foot minimum width needed for sidewalks to install a perpendicular ramp, four feet versus 12 feet. This slide again shows a typical parallel ramp with the color coding that I discussed earlier with the slope ramps, or the sloped areas of the ramp shown in red, the parallel curb shown in yellow. The turning space for the parallel ramp is also at the bottom and doubles as the bottom landing. And this situation on the slide is for a four foot sidewalk. If it were wider, you would also have a small area of pedestrian circulation area. In some locations, especially where grades are fairly severe and right of way is limited or both, you can use both types of ramps at a location, which is typically called a combination ramp. By using a short perpendicular ramp um, provide, that would provide some of your vertical elevation needed to get to your landing and turning space, and then using a parallel ramp to connect to the pedestrian access route somewhere down the line. If the radius of your curb is large, getting two ramps in might be difficult and using a blended transition or blended uh, a depressed corner with a pair of parallel ramp is also a potential solution. And you can see here, the sloped areas of the ramps are shown in red on the bottom figure as well. Speaking of blended transitions, many intersections do use blended transitions or depressed corners, which is a sloped area less than 5%. That's the only real differentiation between the definition of a curb and a blended transition or curb ramp and a blended transition is once you hit that 5% threshold. 
five percent or higher, it's a it's a curb ramp. Less than five percent, it's a blended transition. Where you have the room and the adjacent pedestrian access route and pedestrian circulation areas are at similar elevations. These may be a good option and are quite common in downtown areas. This slide again shows the same color coding as the ramp for a blended transition. Note that blended transitions don't always require a landing or clear space, but they may still require a turning space at the top if the running slope of your blended transition exceeds 2%. If the blended transition slope is 2% or less, as shown on this version of a blended transition, the pedestrian access route and pedestrian circulation area shown on the previous slide are essentially reversed, and you would not be constructing flares in most cases. Ramps require a level turning space, with a turning space being required at the top of perpendicular ramps. That turning space is also required at changes of direction on the pedestrian access route and quite often the ramp turning space for a perpendicular ramp can serve as both the turning space for the ramp as well as the landing. Turning spaces are also required to be a minimum of 48 inches by 48 inches and need to be increased to 60 inch depth if they're constrained, such as by a building or other obstruction at the top that would interfere with the uh, feet of a wheelchair user trying to turn at the top. The maximum running slope for all curb ramps is required to be 1 on 12 or 8.33% and a maximum ramp run of 15 feet is required. This rarely comes into play with perpendicular ramps. It does come into play more so with parallel, which I'll talk about here in a minute. And the maximum slope for the turning space is 2% in both directions. Side flares are needed on many perpendicular ramps where there is an adjacent pedestrian circulation area, as shown on the figure to the left. The flares are part of the pedestrian circulation area, but not the pedestrian access route, and flares are allowed to be up to 10% slope. The slope of the flare is measured parallel to the curb. Where you have a landscaped or grassy area or other detectable barrier, such as a curb, Side flares are not required and the curbs can be used as shown on the figure to the right. In this example, there would be no pedestrian circulation area. That's it for the moment for perpendicular ramps. We'll address some common characteristics of all ramps after we discuss some of the other ramp type characteristics. Parallel ramps also require a turning space, but unlike perpendicular ramps, the turning space for a parallel ramp is located at the bottom. In the figure to the left, two separate sets of parallel ramps are provided, each with a level turning space at the bottom. For the figure on the right, the parallel ramps have a common turning space, blended transition, or depressed corner at the bottom. Both are very user-friendly and compliant. As with perpendicular ramps, the maximum running slope for a parallel ramp is 8.33% or 1 on 12. Where you have severe slopes with sidewalks well above the street level, the length of ramps is not required to exceed 15 feet, even if they don't tie in at a location that would be a compliant slope. Blended transitions are essentially low slope ramps, as we just discussed, with a 5% maximum running slope. Once you hit that 5%, it becomes a ramp. Blended transitions do not require a landing or clear space, but they, again, they may require a turning space at the top if the running slope is over 2%. And as mentioned a moment ago, if the blended transition slope is 2% or less, the pedestrian access route and pedestrian circulation area shown on this slide could be reversed and flares would likely not be needed since the entire blended transition would be a turning space. Okay, so that's it for the unique features of the different types of curb cuts. Now on to some of the requirements that all curb ramps and blended transitions must meet. First is width. All ramps and blended transitions must be a minimum of 48 inches in width. If you have a shared use path within the right of way that crosses a street, the width of that ramp run must be the full width of a shared use path. So if you have an eight foot shared use path approaching a curb ramp, that curb ramp must be eight feet. It cannot simply be the minimum 48 inches required for a pedestrian access route. If you do have flares, they must be located outside the width of the ramp and do not count towards that minimum 48 inch width requirement since they are part of the circulation area and not the access route. 
One of the areas we tend to see noncompliance, especially for perpendicular ramps on a large radius, are with grade breaks at the bottom. Grade breaks are required to be perpendicular to the path of travel on the ramp at the top and bottom for all ramp types. Grade breaks are not permitted on the surface to the ramp run or within the turning spaces. The surfaces at grade breaks need to be flush, with the most common issue typically being at the interface of the curb and the curb ramp or the street and curb edge of metal. There's sometimes a lip at those locations. Grade brakes that are not perpendicular can cause the wheels on a wheelchair to come off the ground and become unstable as shown on the photograph on the left. It's important that both wheels hit the grade brake at the same time for stability, especially for manual wheelchairs. The cross slope for all ramps is 2% maximum, just like all other pedestrian routes. The slope of the gutter or street at the foot of the curb ramps can be up to 5%, which is that maximum running slope for pedestrian crossings that we um, presented earlier. When combined with the maximum 8.33% ramp run slope, that gives you your maximum of 13.33% counter slope at the bottom. While this counter slope can be problematic for wheelchair users at 13%, it is doable. But as that counter slope gets higher, the chances of the wheelchair tipping forward or backward increases dramatically. It is best if you can provide a 2% maximum landing at the bottom of the ramp outside of that grade break, but that is not a requirement. This area at the bottom of the ramp that we just presented for the counter slope is also the area designated as the clear space. A 48 inch by 48 inch wide clear space is required at the bottom of ramps, essentially allowing a wheelchair to sit and wait to cross after they've gone down the ramp. This clear space must be entirely outside of the vehicle travel lane, which is generally considered to be tangent to the street edge at the curb as shown by these pink or purple arrows. The counter slope helps keep the wheelchair in the clear space if you can not provide it as being level. Providing this clear space may require you to pull the grade brake back from the curb so that you are outside of the vehicle travel lane. The next and one of the most apparently confusing common technical requirements for all good curb cuts are detectable warning surfaces, which I'll also note here as DWs, detectable warnings. These are the colored plates with truncated domes you all have certainly seen somewhere. The domes have very specific requirements in the guidelines for size and spacing and to, so that they're detectable by both a cane and underfoot. Detectable warnings are an important indicator that a pedestrian is about to enter a hazardous area. Detectable warning requirements were clarified by the Access Board in 2014 in a publication you can find on their website since they were either not used where required or used where they were not required which can cause confusion for blind pedestrians. I'm not covering the finer details about the domes today, but I am going to focus on other requirements. If you're interested in the details about the domes, you can find those in R305.1. Previously, many contractors used forms to stamp truncated domes into the concrete or use pavers with truncated domes. It didn't take long to realize that many times this concrete that was supposed to be the dome got stuck in the forms and ended up not being detectable and that both the stamp domes and domes on pavers get sheared off pretty quickly by snow clearing equipment in northern climates. We strongly discourage these installations. There's a wide variety of materials that are much more durable being used, uh, whether you set them in wet concrete or attach them to an existing concrete panel. One of the requirements for detectable warnings is that they contrast visually with the adjacent surfaces. This permits persons with low vision and other users to see where their target crossing point is on the other side of an intersection to allow the shortest crossing distance. While no specific colors are required or even mentioned in ProAg, you often see yellow, orange, and black as the most common. There are some persons with low vision that would like to see black not be allowed, as they say it appears as a hole in the distance to some of them. Regarding dimensions, detectable warnings are required to be a minimum of 24 inches deep in the direction of travel and be the full width of the ramp, exclusive again of any flares present. This would seem to be a pretty easy requirement to understand, but I can't tell you how many new curb ramps get a non-compliant detectable warning put on them. Contractors cut them, angle them, and all sorts of things and get them wrong far too often. When the detectable warnings are not the full width of the ramp or are less than 24 inches deep for that full width, 
there is a chance a blind pedestrian could pass right by without detecting them. Generally, full width would be within an inch or two of the outside of the ramp at most. For placement of detectable warnings on perpendicular ramps, you have two possibilities. First is where the grade break on both sides is less than five feet from the back of curb. In those situations, you place the detectable warning on the ramp run itself within one dome of the bottom grade break. Second is where the grade break on one side is more than five feet from the back of curb. Here you would place the detectable warning on the bottom landing at the back of curb. In this illustration, the green area serves as not only the turning space, but also the clear space. For parallel ramps, placement of detectable warnings is pretty basic. It goes on the turning space at the back of curb. Similarly, placement of the detectable warning at blended transitions is at the back of curb, unless there is a raised crosswalk or depressed corner, where it would then be placed at the flush transition at the street and sidewalk, which typically is the back of curb. Detectable warnings are also required for medians and other pedestrian refuge islands that are six feet or more in depth. The requirement for islands are the same, 24 inches deep and the full width of the ramp or curb opening in the island, which is 60 inches minimum as we presented earlier. Sometimes you will see the pedestrian route jogged over on some islands or medians to line up with the traffic signal better and it also helps to slow down bicycles. Where you have an at-grade railroad crossing on the pedestrian access route, detectable warnings are also required. The near edge of the detectable warning is required to be six feet minimum to 15 feet maximum from the center line of the nearest rail. If there are gates provided for pedestrians or the vehicle gate crosses over the pedestrian access route to stop pedestrians, that detectable warning is required to be on the side of the gate opposite the rail. Now for a brief discussion about some of the other pro-WAG requirements starting with street crossings. An important consideration for signalized street crossings is the amount of time you give for the pedestrian. PROWAG references MUTCD requirements for pedestrian signal phase timing of 3.5 feet per second minimum. Longer crossings obviously require a longer walk time for the pedestrian. One way to help disabled pedestrians is to minimize the length of the crossing. Bump outs at intersection can be used like shown here. I don't think this is Michigan since there are palm trees, but I'm pretty sure anyone watching this that is responsible for snow plowing in winter just had their blood pressure go up a little when they saw this. It's not very user friendly for a snow plow driver, but certainly is a good option in warmer climates for pedestrians, cutting the crossing distance down by as much as 50%. In addition, the larger surface area of the curve gives you an opportunity to separate those ramps and provide a ramp for each crossing instead of putting in a depressed corner or a diagonal ramp. At roundabouts, specific requirements were put in ProWAG to address the concerns, especially of blind pedestrians. That required all roundabouts with multiple lane entries for a traffic direction provide pedestrian activated signals. These can include hawk or other flashing pedestrian signals. An example here from one of DLZ's roundabout designs. Here we have a two lane approach to a roundabout which meets ProWAG standard for needing special treatment for pedestrians. You can see there are three different sets of flashing pedestrian beacons that are activated by the pedestrian and requires that vehicles stop at the crosswalk for pedestrians. There are a variety of signal options you can use, but any one of them that you decide to utilize must meet MUTCD requirements. Similarly, if you have multi-lane turning bypass or slip lanes, whether at a roundabout or signalized intersection, the same pedestrian activated signal of some standard type is required. In this aerial photo, we have slip lanes on three legs of an intersection, though all of them are only one lane. If any of them were two or more lanes, they would require the special pedestrian activated signals we just presented. For pedestrian signals and push buttons, the scoping provisions of ProWAG simply incorporate MUTCD requirements by reference. You can see here there are some basic requirements regarding operable parts uh, that are required by ProWAG that include a level clear space at those push buttons, the height of the buttons, which does deviate slightly from what MUTCD requires, and a requirement for the operable parts to be usable by a closed fist. Accessible pedestrian signal push buttons should be placed near, but not too close to the street and crosswalk. MUTCD specifies that push buttons be one and a half to six feet from the edge of the curb or shoulder and five feet maximum from the crosswalk marking. Similarly, there is also a requirement for 10 feet of separation between push buttons, especially when audible indicators for crossings and button locations are provided. 
Buttons need to be two inches in diameter, and include a tactile area and signage with an arrow, both of which point in the direction of the crossing controlled by that button. This is a common figure from MUTCD 4E-3 that you will see in ProWAG presentations on accessible pedestrian signals. This figure shows a brown hatched area as those areas recommended for placement of push buttons with the designated landings for the ramps, which provides that one and a half to six feet from the curb and five feet maximum from the crosswalk. When deciding where to put your push buttons, you also do need to consider, however, your other pedestrian access requirements like 48 inch clear width. Most communities are slowly phasing in accessible pedestrian signals and currently have older types that do not meet the current ProWag and MUTCD. Often these older types don't even meet the former MUTCD requirements with no signage, inaccessible push buttons, and a variety of other issues. Many push buttons are also locate, located where a person in a wheelchair can't even reach the button to push it. Only when new pedestrian signals are provided or when existing pedestrian signals have the signal controller and software altered or the signal heads are replaced, do these existing pedestrian signals need to be upgraded to the most current types. We usually only see the newer accessible pedestrian signals in urban areas or sometimes large college campuses. For on-street parking, the scoping and technical provisions are pretty straightforward. When you provide on-street parking that is marked or metered, you must provide accessible parking spaces with compliant signage. The number of accessible spaces required is found on table R217 and based on the parking count per block face. You can see on the figure shown on this slide, the area outlined in red is a block face. If you provide on-street parking anywhere on that block face, your total number of spaces there would dictate how many accessible spaces you need to provide on that block. The location of those spaces is an important consideration and needs to respect your grades as much as you can. While you would typically have accessible spaces on every block that you provide parking, there are instances where it meets the equivalent facilitation provisions of ProWag to move them to a different location. The advisory in section R309.1 notes that accessible parking spaces should be located where the street has the least crown and grade and close to key des des destinations. Excuse me. ProWag does not require any specific grades or slopes for accessible parking spaces or access aisles, but obviously the flatter the better as we've talked about repeatedly today. There's no differentiation within the right of way between van accessible and regular car accessible spaces either, like outside of the right of way. ProWag does not specify anything different related to dimensions for on-street parking spaces, requiring only a compliant width access aisle where required. For on-street parallel parking, the requirements for the accessible spaces differs based on the width of the adjacent sidewalk. For wide sidewalks, which are defined as 14 feet or more in width, you need a five foot wide marked access aisle at the parking level adjacent to each accessible space with a connection to the adjacent sidewalk, typically via a ramp. In alterations, you are allowed to deviate from that and put it at the end of the block if you're not touching the sidewalk or the curb. For narrow sidewalks, which are less than 14 feet in width, no access aisles required adjacent to the space, but the access, accessible space is required to be placed at the end of that block near a corner curb ramp, which serves as your access to the sidewalk. If you have perpendicular and angled on street spaces, you're required to have an eight foot wide marked access aisle adjacent to and at full depth of the parking space. The access aisle must connect to the adjacent sidewalk, again, typically with the ramp. While two spaces are allowed to share a common access aisle, you cannot place a ramp within that access aisle. Here you see a good example of two angled spaces sharing an eight foot wide access aisle and each sign, uh, each space having its own sign. Parking meters or pay stations for on-street parking have requirements for operable parts as well, as well as placement and height as shown here. Basically, meters need to be at the head or foot of a space, and any displays for meters or pay stations need to have a level clear space and be visible, uh, have information visible at 3.3 feet of height. The photo on this slide shows metered on street parking. I guess that these are wide sidewalks, so both spaces would be required to have an access aisle and ramp, which they could share. Even if the sidewalk is less than 14 feet, the space at the top is not compliant since it is not nearest the corner. And last, some of the miscellaneous or other requirements of ProWag. Most of these are similar to the ADA building standards. 
First are protruding objects. No object is permitted to extend into pedestrian circulation paths more than four inches between 27 and 80 inches high. For shared use paths, nothing can be below 80 inches for the entire width. Some common protruding objects include things like traffic signal boxes, hanging baskets, and vegetation. Post-mounted objects, including signs, have similar limitations on this protrusion, uh, being four inches maximum from either the pole or the base of the pole, as long as that base is at least two and a half inches high. If you have a sign with multiple posts and the distance between them is over 12 inches in width, you must have the lowest edge of the sign at 27 inches maximum or the highest edge at least 78 and three quarter of inches high. Where you have stairs, guy wires, and other items within the right of way with the leading edge below that 78 and three quarter of inches, you need to provide a barrier such as a rail that has a leading edge at 27 inch maximum height. These situations are much more common in urban areas where you might have a fire escape or similar uh, type of stairway, but guy wires also meet that standard. One item not specifically addressed within the guidelines, but important to include today is drainage. All right-of-way facilities need to have proper drainage to avoid ponding and issues associated with ponding water. In northern climates, this ponded water on sidewalks and curb ramps can freeze and be very slippery. Evidence of ponding besides the presence of water can include silt deposits. Where there is ponded water, pedestrians will usually look for an alternate route like this pedestrian is doing. The last items I'm going to lump together quickly are the various uh, other right-of-way amenities. Uh, most of these have technical provisions that mirror the ADA standards and they're located here on this slide. It's important to understand them and if you are interested in specific requirements, you can look in ProAg starting at Part R407. Most of the requirements are pretty straightforward, but since we are running short on time and I'm running a little longer than I anticipated, I'm just going to go on to the next slide and start talking about the most common issues for curb ramps and sidewalks. First, curb ramps. Excessive slopes on ramps, especially cross slopes, are way too common. When you have a running slope of 4% for the pedestrian access route like shown here, there has to be an adjustment made to provide that level turning space as well as a compliant cross slope on the ramp. Excessive running slopes can be the result of choosing the wrong type of ramp as well. If you have a good location for a ramp, but it's too steep, you just need to look at lowering the adjacent approaches and chase the grade a little bit. You can't simply put in a sloped section to get people from the sidewalk to the crosswalk. Remember, the maximum compliant running slope is one on 12, one inch of rise for every 12 inches or one foot of run. You simply cannot make up a six inch rise from the curb to the sidewalk with only four feet of tree lawn area. Like other sloped areas, flares are not that complicated but that 10% maximum is not going to be attainable with a rolled curb or other treatment uh, being utilized as a flare. Providing either a non-compliant landing or turning space or no landing or turning space really shouldn't happen in 2021. The transition in the turn for a wheelchair like this that is abrupt can easily cause them to tip over at, and at a minimum be extremely difficult to use. Many locations with excessive slopes and non-compliant landings or turning spaces I've already presented, along with some of what's upcoming, can be corrected simply by using the, the correct type of curb ramp. Too many times a perpendicular ramp has tried to be forced into a location where a parallel ramp would be a much better solution. As well as grade breaks, even, uh, it doesn't even seem to be considered in some designs or ignored during construction. While some of these examples on this slide from fairly new curb ramps are close to being perpendicular for grade breaks, others are not even near close and really do present a safety barrier for wheelchair users. While I've already discussed drainage, I did want to mention it one more time as being a pretty common issue that needs to be resolved. Uh, again, 0% slopes are best for disabled users, but they aren't realistic for drainage. Try to find a balance between the two. I mean, do you really need to max out your cross slope at 2% if you have a 4% running slope? Uh, another thing to consider is utilizing a spill or a reverse curb if you're needed to try to avoid ponding at the bottom of your curb ramp. And detectable warnings, uh, one of my pet peeves. In some cases, they're just not there, and uh, there's all kinds of vinyl and other materials with truncated domes that you can attach, even if the rest of your curb ramp is not good, but at least it would be a temporary solution for blind users. I could literally show you hundreds and hundreds of photographs of non-compliant for width or full depth um, uh, detectable warnings, but here's just a few of my favorites. <clears throat> 
Having utility structures within a ramp or landing, or sometimes even in the clear space at the bottom of a ramp is surprisingly common. Uh, structures we see here are primarily manhole covers or water valves, but they can also be drainage structures. And sometimes contractors just seem to know what they're doing. You know, they've been doing it for 30 years, so you just need to trust them. Um, I would certainly urge you not to trust anyone um, simply because they've been doing something for a long time. They may be doing it for 30 years all wrong. And quickly, a few uh, sidewalk issues as we're wrapping up. Um, cross slope, I've talked about that at length. There are not only driveways, but sometimes large stretches of sidewalk that are cross slope. Um, incorrectly to provide drainage. Obstructions, again, some are easier to fix or work around than others, but without a solution, they can be a significant barrier to access along the pedestrian access route. Level changes, again, i uh, talked about um, pretty obvious, uh, often the result of trees, and unfortunately, sometimes your only long-term solution for corrective action is removal of the tree, which isn't always a popular solution. And sometimes the issue is just pavement that's outlived its useful life or is damaged, regardless of what material is used. Cracking and crumbling sidewalks can quickly become essentially unusable by either separations or vertical separations or both. So in summary, um, PROWAG is currently not an enforceable standard, but based on being the best practice, we certainly encourage everyone to utilize right of way, uh, the, the right of way standards in PROWAG as a minimum. We're hoping that PROAG will soon be adopted, and we do know that it is a priority for the Access Board to finally give that uh, a, a standard designation rather than a guideline. A couple quick resources as we wrap up. Um, ADA.gov is the U.S. Department of Justice website. Contains a lot of good information, including uh, the ability to download the 2010 ADA standards at the link shown here. The website for the U.S. Access Board at access-board.gov, and I have included here the link to the PROAG guidelines that include the 2013 Supplemental Notice Information for Shared Use Paths. And I certainly encourage anyone using the 2011 PROAG to ensure that you have the uh, version that includes the uh, shared use paths. Both the Department of Justice and Access Board sites do include contact information for technical assistance, as well as a lot of other good information. And you can sign up for email updates as well to get information as it comes out. The ADA National Network includes great resources and reference material, uh, including an archive of the uh, topic-specific presentations that are given quite oftentimes by the Access Board. Um, I certainly urge you to register and get, you will then get notifications of any upcoming webinars as well. And one additional resource I highly recommend you review to better understand barriers experienced by disabled pedestrians is an older video series um, done by the U.S. Access Board. It used to be available on their, access, on their uh, website, but it seems like it's been pulled. But if you do a search on YouTube for accessible sidewalks, you'll find the four parts that I show here on the slides, um, each one showing different barriers and difficulties presented within the right-of-way for the four main uh, user groups that we talked about. Um, while the videos are old and not at all professionally produced, they do show quite well the experience of using the right-of-way from the perspective of that disabled pedestrian. So with that, I did run a little bit long. I apologize for that, anyone that had to get off. Um, if you do need to get back to work, um, I'm going to entertain questions at this time. Um, feel free, if you have one, to type it in the Q&A box. And I see that we do have a few questions in there, and I'll try to get to all of them. If you're not able to stay on during the Q&A and need to get back um, and you do have questions, please feel free to email me, email me at the address shown on this slide. So with that, I will go on to questions. All right, so the first question I have is, how is responsibility for these requirements managed where private owners must utilize the public right of way as part of an accessible route? For example, a private parking lot across the street from a primary building or site. Uh, well, the responsibility in that case would be two-pronged. One, the private owner certainly still needs to ensure that they are providing access into their facility. Um, if the private owner needs to utilize the public right-of-way as part of an accessible route, from parking to their building, 
that accessibility would be through the public right of way. So I would uh, assume at that point that you would want to um, discuss with the uh, entity that controls the right of way, whether it's the city or county or sometimes the State Department of Transportation, to ensure that you have an accessible route. Uh, it may not be at that point uh, that you wanted it to be directly from your parking lot to your building. There may be a requirement or a need to have um, your customers or your employees uh, follow the sidewalk to an intersection, cross at an intersection, and then uh, utilize the pedestrian access route to get back to your, your facility. But again, this is where cooperation and public-private partnerships are really, really good, um, especially where you have shopping districts and sidewalks are difficult. Um, you know, funding, anyone on this call that's from a public entity knows the difficulties of funding and the fact that dollars are limited. And uh, while downtowns are certainly a typically a high priority in projects that we evaluate, um, even as a high priority, uh, you may not be able to address all of the situations adequately. And uh, the business owners or maybe even a, a downtown development association or authority or some other um, quasi government entity can step in and help facilitate that cooperation to make sure that all businesses have good access to their facilities from not only private parking, but public parking lots as well. Next question, um, if an auto is a stop uh, light and the auto engine turns off, what can be done to help or assist a blind individual at the crossing? Um, let me read that again. If an auto is a sign, I'm assuming this is the the lights going out um, for traffic signals. So if the traffic signals go out and everybody's treating it as a four-way stop, what can be done to assist? Obviously, um, for safety reasons and probably even in many states, I know uh, pedestrians do have the right of way. Um, at non-signalized non uh, intersections or where signals have gone out, which typically are treated as four-way stops. So I'm assuming that that is the uh, question that is being asked. If not, uh, Richard, please uh, email me or give me a call and we can chat about it to, uh, to get those, uh, make sure we're answering your question adequately. Um, Next question, are there detectable warning surfaces that serve double duty as an inlet? All too often I see the bottom of a curb ramp be a local low spot for drainage resulting in ponding. My city is particularly flat and even when design may indicate adequate running slope for drainage, in practice it doesn't always work out. Otherwise, what suggestions do you have to remedy retrofit this situation? Well, I think that's uh, one of the examples I pointed out in the drainage issues. Um, I am not currently aware of any detectable warning surfaces that would allow enough drainage through the perforations to really be uh, able to provide drainage for stormwater. Um, if they did this, the, all of those openings would have to be a half inch or less each. Uh, and in all likelihood, they would plug up very, very quickly and probably provide uh, or present more uh, difficulty than, than they would solve. Um, again, being very, very flat is, is not something that's unique to a lot of places. I mean, some places are very hilly, um, whereas others are not. I would certainly look at other solutions, such as the spill curb or the reverse curb that I talked about. As long as you can maintain some type of a flow line from your, uh, from your curb to your catch basins. Um, you know, some of the examples that I showed photographs of um, for drainage problems, have curb ramps immediately adjacent to, not at, but immediately adjacent to the, the curb ramp. And the problem there is that someone has gone in and designed a clear space and they're crossing to have minimal cross slope, not realizing that by doing that, they're creating a small ridge and uh, ponding water within the landing, bottom landing of that uh, uh, curb ramp. So, um, you know, curb ramps are, are something that, especially if you're, working from a standard that is a state standard, you know, a lot of states still have typical, you know, they call them, you know, type A, type B, type whatever, um, all the way different designations of the alphabet. And 
Well, we've learned early on in our designs to really look at more detailed grades for curb ramps, especially in retrofit situations where you know drainage is going to be a concern or slopes of your ramps and turning spaces and clear spaces are going to be a concern. You may need to do a little more intensive design. Um, and in the case of a detectable warning surface, um, you can put that again, if it's a perpendicular ramp, you don't have to put it at the bottom. You can put your detectable warning at the slope on the ramps itself uh, above the grade break. And that will allow the opportunity to get at least a 2% grade, um, sometimes both perpendicular and parallel to the path of travel to get your stormwater out of there. So hopefully I answered that uh, appropriately. If you have a specific design you want me to take a look at, feel free to, to email that to me. Uh, Next question, the small triangle and the innermost edge of the curb radius, uh, I see how they direct the user, but can they also be a tripping hazard? Well, the, uh, the innermost curbing area, typically we would try to not make it a vertical face curb unless we had some other type of barrier there, but I do recognize that that certainly can be a trip hazard. Um, in those cases, you're probably better off uh, making that just a depressed corner and eliminating that small triangular piece at the curb ramp. Even though you're trying to separate out the two um, curb ramps independently, uh, the benefit there may not overweigh the, uh, the potential hazard of tripping. And again, the, the tripping is for ambulatory people. You know, nowadays everybody's crossing the street, texting and streaming and everything else on their phone. So that's really where your biggest tripping hazard is. Um, wheelchair users are able to utilize it without any problem. So those, those types of uh, ramps are accessible, but from a pedestrian circulation area, they do present that trip hazard that you did talk about. Uh, someone's referring back to slide 78. I recall learning a best practice of three and a half feet per second for flash don't walk with a total walk of 2.5 feet per second. Is that accurate? If not, do you have a diff different recommendation? Well, my understanding is that MUTCD um, references three and a half feet per second. Um, I'm not exactly sure how that's broken out, but you can certainly refer to MUTCD for that. Uh, and again, as I pointed out, uh, three and a half feet per second for me is fine. Two and a half feet per second for me may be fine, but I'm not using a wheelchair or a walker or have a bad knee or have a bad back or be 90 years old. Uh, or pushing a double stroller with uh, with two babies in it or any of the other types of users in the right of way that may have limitations. So um, I would certainly utilize your results of your uh, traffic study and uh, your traffic signal requirements to maintain your vehicle level of service uh, by incorporating that crossing speed into those projections. Uh, there's, again, always a balance. Um, you need to provide accessibility for pedestrians by providing long enough crossing time, but you're certainly not going to make it uh, eight feet per second um, um, or one and a half feet per second to simply uh, accommodate uh, non-vehicle or traffic at the detriment of your vehicle level of service. So, um, I, again, there's a happy medium there, and I really can't give a recommendation because, again, each situation is different, but there are a number of engineers and planners and transportation uh, professionals out there that can certainly uh, help you and assist you. Um, next question, do we need curb ramps at commercial drives? I'm assuming this is on driveways uh, within the sidewalk, and this is a pretty common question we get. Um, do you need ramps? Yes, you certainly do need sloped paths to be able to get through driveways. The question that we normally get are, do we need to include detectable warnings? And the question, and the answer there typically is no. Um, detectable warnings are primarily at street crossings, which would be intersections or um, mid-block crossings of streets. Now, if you have a commercial drive that is a signalized intersection, uh, such as you might have at a large shopping mall or even maybe a large strip center, it certainly might be advantageous and recommended to put a detectable warning at those curb ramps for those commercial drives. Now, do you put a detectable warning at every uh, fast food place along a, a busy business route? The answer there is uh, definitely not. Again, uh, 
disabled pedestrians, particularly those with uh, vision impairments and those that are blind, utilize those detectable warnings to know when they're going from a pedestrian area to a non-pedestrian area. So if you're putting them at every driveway, it's, um, it, it's gonna be very, very confusing for them. So use them diligently, look at your traffic counts, um, Vehicles that are exiting a Wendy's driveway or drive-through are going to see pedestrians using the sidewalk and they're going to stop. Uh, when you get a platoon of traffic turning right or left at a signal coming into a large shopping center, that might be a situation where those vehicles are trying to get out of the road and they might not really be paying close attention. And those are where you might want to consider utilizing um, detectable warnings. And especially if you have detectable or if you have a, a pedestrian signals at those types of mid-block crossings at commercial drives, uh, I would say you would definitely at, at those little crossings definitely want to have a um, detectable warning at those ramps. Next question, is there a requirement to always have a landing at the top and bottom of ramps that exceed 5%? What to do when the landing makes the ramp exceed the 8.33%? Well, remember, Landings are required at the top of perpendicular ramps and at the bottom of parallel ramps. So there is not a requirement to have a landing at both the top and bottom of either one of those. Now, again, that's the minimum. So if you can make a nice level turning space and landing at the top of your perpendicular ramp and have a nice level um, clear space and whatnot at the bottom of your perpendicular ramp, certainly encourage you to go ahead and do that. But your requirement for a perpendicular ramp is only that you have a top landing and turning space. Similarly with a parallel ramp, the only requirement for landings at parallel ramps is at the bottom. Now, again, that's not to say that having a landing at the top of a parallel ramp is not a great idea, especially if it's fairly long and, and at maximum slope but the requirements are only for a landing at the bottom of parallel ramps. So when, you're, when your landing makes the ramp exceed 8.33%, that means you're probably trying to squeeze in a perpendicular ramp where a parallel ramp needs to go. Again, at one on 12, for every inch of rise, you need 12 feet of run, or 12 inches of run. Uh, I'm sorry, the other way around. Uh, so I went on 12. So if you have a six inch curb to attain that six inch rise in elevation, you need a six foot ramp. And then you have to add on your four foot um, landing at the top for a perpendicular ramp. If you take that same situation and you make it a, a parallel ramp, you only need a four foot width. So again, look at your right of way. If your right of way is 10 feet or less, you're not going to be able to make a perpendicular ramp fit unless you do something weird or you don't have a full um, six inch curb. So again, um, each case is unique, but if your landing makes the ramp exceed 8.33%, that means that you have exceeded or that you probably tried to fit in the wrong type of ramp and you need to look at either a parallel ramp or maybe even a combination ramp might fit in if you're close to that 10 or 12 feet. Next question, are there any physical materials that could help assess the best options when visiting a site? This could be helpful for local residents and advocates to understand and recommend the best treatments. A four by five template for turning area, foldable layouts for minimum perpendicular ramp, et cetera. Um, I am not familiar with any physical materials that would help you assess uh, site conditions. Um, we do a lot of assessments of, of all the different right-of-way facilities as part of our ADA transition plans for clients. And you just need to know what you need to measure. You know, when you're doing a curb ramp, you know you need to measure curb width and curb slopes and landings and turning spaces and clear spaces and all those different types of things. Um, the, uh, in, in lieu of having a physical material, I think the better thing to have would be some type of a checklist or a diagram. And there are a number of those out there that show you all the different things you need to measure uh, to determine whether or not they are compliant and, and take it from there. So hopefully that answers your question, Gretchen. And if you do have questions, certainly uh, forward those on to me and I'll be happy to answer them offline if I don't get to them all here uh, in the next half hour or so.
Uh, someone asked, uh, I may have missed it, but did you mention that pedestrian signals are required at multi-lane crossings, such as a dual lane roundabout? Yes, I did mention that, Chris. That is in the slide. If you missed it, um, I would refer you back to the slides. Um, and again, those slides as well as a video of today's presentation will be made available sometime later and you will be notified as an attendee um, of how you can get a hold of those things. Next question, parallel ramps and transitions that extend around the entire curb or turn and has a lot of truck traffic that tends to jump the curbs. Are pike bollards or other type of barrier recommended inside the ramp to prevent trucks from cutting the corner? This is probably one of the issues that I did not cover only because it's, it's uh, not always an, an issue, but certainly it is in areas with truck traffic. Um, one of the reasons I think that we have difficulties with curb ramps and have to utilize depressed corners and uh, the larger radius um, diagonal ramps where you have trucks is simply because of that. We, uh, as designers, um, engineers don't want to make the radius of those curbs so high to be able to facilitate the turn for a WB60 semi-tractor trailer. Um, and yeah, clearly they can be a hazard um, when pedestrians are standing there waiting to cross and you have a truck turning and uh, the, the only way that the truck can make that turn is to uh, uh, ride up on the curb. Um, I don't know that any bollard or any type of barrier um, that you could put in the ramp um, is going to prevent the trucks. I mean, the trucks are going to go up on the ramp. If they can't make the turn, uh, especially if there's somebody on the opposing traffic movement that they're trying to turn into that they can't swing wide, they're going to ride up on the curb. The question is going to be, do they do it at a speed with pedestrians present that the pedestrians see what the inevitable conflict is going to be and they're able to get out of the way. Um, if that's a situation that you have fairly regularly at a couple of key locations, one thing you might want to consider doing there is putting your pedestrian push buttons out of the way. Um, and that would be a situation where a deviation from the distance standards from the curb or crosswalk may be warranted um, for safety concerns. And also so that the trucks don't wipe out your, your push button pedestal. Um, I mean, the push buttons don't do anyone any good if trucks hit them every, every couple of weeks. So moving them out of the way, maybe even show in, uh, put some markings on the sidewalk, uh, cross, you know, hatch out some areas on the sidewalk to show where the truck tires typically ride up on the curb and hope that your pedestrians give it and maybe even some signage. But pedestrians tend to be creatures of habit and use the same intersections regularly for their traversing uh, their way within the right of way. And they probably have seen more than one truck uh, cross areas that they frequent fairly regularly. So, um, um, uh, so someone is, I think, clarifying one of the earlier questions about a new car's engine turning off at a stop. So I think that probably refers to a hybrid vehicle. Uh, and blind pedestrians not being able to hear the engines running. Um, again, I think that's one of the reasons that they instituted the requirement for pedestrian signals at roundabouts is because the speed of vehicles utilizing and entering roundabouts is so low that uh, blind pedestrians could not hear the vehicles um, turning um, because their engines are idled down so low. Um, whereas they can hear them with their, as they're going through at 40 miles an hour, knowing that they're going through, they can hear the acceleration, deceleration of the engine. So um, there's really nothing I'm aware of that uh, is pertinent to that. Now, that's not to say that because it's been 10 years um, since the current pro -Ag, uh guidelines have been developed, that they haven't already made improvements that they'll um, institute into a new version that will go out for public notice and comment uh, when they get to that point. And it may very well be that some of these questions that are not addressed in the current standards will be, or in the current guidelines will be addressed in a future one. In fact, I've got a list of things I would like to see them address that I'm going to comment on, on both the ADA standards as well as pro -Ag when they come out. Uh, the next question, do you need a landing on a one-way perpendicular curb ramp? Um, a one-way perpendicular curb ramp, I'm assuming, is going to be one that, and, and sometimes the identification of whether a ramp is perpendicular or parallel is not always uh, there. So, example, if you have a, uh, 
a curb radius and there's only sidewalk on one of the directions of travel. Uh, I'm trying to think if I have a good example. Oh, well, let's say the, the, the slide on the right, or the picture on the right of this slide that's currently being displayed, if that pole wasn't there, do you consider that a perpendicular curb ramp or a parallel curb ramp? Um, now this one is low, uh, low grade, so I would assume this is probably gonna be a blended transition. But um, anytime that you can provide a landing at the top and or bottom of any ramp, it's certainly to your advantage. Now, that running slope provides you with the ability to do drainage. And drainage of 4% on a ramp or 6% on a ramp for running slope is a lot easier to provide than a flat ramp and a 1.5% or 2% cross slope. So. Um, where you can provide landings, I would certainly do so. If you're defining a ramp as perpendicular, like you are in your question, Theodore, um, you would need to have a landing at the top. Perpendicular ramps require landings at the top. Parallel ramps require landings at the bottom. Um, again, once you reach that 5% is where you need to have the landing. That's where you meet that criteria of being a ramp or not being a ramp, being a blended transition. The next question uh, talks about van accessible on street parallel and access aisle needs to meet requirements. Um, I, I did mention it briefly, but I know I was going a little quickly through the requirements for on street parking. But within the right of way, the standards and uh, PROAG do not differentiate between van accessible and regular vehicle accessible spaces. In fact, the PROAG standards do not provide any requirement for width of parking spaces, depth of parking spaces, or anything to that nature. The only thing that the PROAG guidelines require for on-street parking is parallel spaces must have the uh, five foot wide access aisle where there are wide sidewalks and angled and perpendicular on street parking spaces must have a, an eight foot wide access aisle adjacent to them, both of which must um, be accessible to the sidewalk, be a ramp, or be for parallel spaces, be at the end of a block. You're not allowed by ProWag, there's no nothing in there that permits you to put a angled or perpendicular space next to a curb ramp and call that your access. Now, obviously, if you have an, uh, an angled space and an access aisle on the right side of it, and the access aisle is immediately adjacent to a corner curb ramp, that I think meets the definition for accessibility. But there is no differentiation between on-street van spaces and on-street non-van spaces. Question, what should be done for mid-block crossings where the profile of the roadway is 11%? Well, as pointed out in the presentation, there is no standard or requirement for grade crossings at mid-blocks. Um, that would be considered a compliant uh, mid-block location, even though the profile of the roadway is 11%. Um, it really isn't usable by people with disabilities. And if you uh, want to continue to utilize that, you know, it's, it's at a major location that you have uh, people utilizing it. Um, I would suggest that you either have uh, one of two options. One would be to get rid of it, which if it's there, it's certainly there for a reason. Your other option, um, because it is compliant, but not really accessible, would be to uh, provide signage for an alternate route for people that utilize either wheelchairs or a mobility device. Um, to provide them with the location of the nearest uh, intersection that would be compliant or provide a flatter slope for them to cross. Um, that's certainly one of the issues with mid-block crossings. That 11% cross slope on a mid-block crossing is, is compliant with the current PROAG guidelines because mid-block crossings are allowed to meet the grade of the road. But again, that's really not accessible to a wheelchair user or many um, users of mobility devices. Uh, the next question, during ramp construction, do you have to provide pedestrian detours for the sidewalks approaching 
uh, from the side streets if these approaching sidewalks are not ADA compliant. For example, if the approaching sidewalks are not four feet wide. Um, during ramp construction, uh, those ramps would not be accessible. Um, and therefore, if someone were in a wheelchair and they got to the intersection where you're doing your curb ramp work, they would essentially be um, isolated and have to either turn back or whatnot. So the MUTCD requirements for signage and advance notice and everything, um, I believe, I'm pretty, pretty confident of this. Uh, I don't refer to MUTCD a lot because I don't, I'm not an engineer, so I don't do a lot of designs, but um, the typical requirement for accessible routes and signage, and especially informational and guidance signage, is that you would place the sign to minimize backtracking. So for example, if you were doing a curb ramp reconstruction on both ramps at a corner, at the um, other blocks at the far end of the pedestrian access route that connects to that intersection under construction, you would typically put signs, you know, cross here and make them go across the street to utilize the pedestrian access route. So um, much like you have uh, detours for uh, vehicles when you're doing road construction, and you have alternate routes and detours for those cars, but you still need to maintain traffic in some situations. Um, you do need to provide a maintaining uh, the, a pedestrian traffic when you're doing construction of those right of way facilities for pedestrians. So um, typically you'll see things like cross here, uh, the construction might not be to the far end of the other block, but again, by the time they get to the other end of the block, um, and see that they can't cross, they'd have to turn around and go back to where they were anyway. So that advanced signage, you know, similar to what the, uh, the, the sign on the right here on the slide that's currently being displayed shows, uh, if the sidewalk is closed, you know, cross here, that sidewalk could be closed mid-block, it could be closed all the way at the other intersection. Um, at the far end of this segment of sidewalk. So uh, in this case, you would certainly encourage pedestrians to uh, cross, cross here over to the other side. Um, and this is also another uh, good example of making sure you have a, a good plan for that maintenance of traffic. You know, you wouldn't want to go in and do all the curb ramps, all four quadrants of curb ramps, all at the same time. You need to make sure that, especially where there are high pedestrian destination uh, facilities, like shopping center or a post office or a doctor's office or hospital or something like that, you certainly wouldn't want to shut down every curb ramp at that intersection all at the same time and preclude um, uh, pedestrians from utilizing it. And in some cases, you might even need to put in a temporary ramp. Um, there are a number of photographs that I have that uh, for time's sake I couldn't certainly show, but um, there are temporary ramps that you can put up that span over. You can put down temporary uh, uh, matting over grass. I mean, there's, you know, you need to be a little creative, but the key thing to keep in mind is that those pedestrians, especially some of the disabled pedestrians, don't have a lot of options and you might not be aware of what's at the other end. So give them as much guidance as you possibly can. Uh, give them uh, guidance with signage to minimize their need to backtrack. Uh, you know, you wouldn't want to allow someone on this slide here on the right, is, again, assuming that pole wasn't there. Um, if you're doing construction on the ramp at the far end, you wouldn't want to give anyone the misperception that they can take that sidewalk all the way to the end, and then when they get there, it's under construction, and they'd have to turn around and come back. So advanced signage, advanced notice, all good information in the MUTCD um, standards which are, um, I think are, are available. You can get to them without some type of a, a license or a fee. Um, and if you're not, uh, certainly uh, let me know and I can see what I can track down for you. But um, I'm sure someone in your organization uh, or a consultant that works for you has access to MUTCD standards and is very familiar with that. So the, uh, the last question I see here is, uh, asking if there are professional uh, continuing education credits uh, available for this course. Um, there are, and everyone that is attending um, will receive or be given the opportunity to receive um, a certificate of attendance for this presentation. So um, I'm sure Tiffany, who is uh, helping me monitor and answer the questions uh, and set it all up for us, um, 
she's one of the people behind the scenes here. So um, yay, Tiffany. Uh, she will ensure that uh, those go out to you if you specifically need it for your licensing and whatnot. Um, and what we provide you is not adequate, certainly let us know and we will do what we can to ensure that you do get credits for, uh, for today's course. So um, with that, that is the last question that I have. So um, in closing, I would like to uh, thank uh, the members of the US Access Board. Uh, the staff there allowed me to utilize some of their photographs and figures in today's webinar. And uh, also want to thank all of you that are still on, 109 of you are still on, for your interest in attendance. Uh, hopefully you found it informational and now you have a better understanding of, uh, of the right-of-way guidelines. Um, as I noted earlier, um, this is a series that we are having and we do have a number of future webinars on different ADA topic sets, so watch for those advertisements. Um, tentatively, our next ADA webinar is scheduled for September 8th. I haven't decided on a topic for that as yet, but if there's one that uh, you really think I need to address, maybe bathrooms or drinking fountains or uh, uh, ramps and stairs or whatever, uh, I certainly um, taking uh, uh, suggestions and uh, requests, so don't hesitate to send those to me if you have something you would like me to cover but uh, I think I have five or six of them that I'm planning on doing to try to get through all of the ADA standards. And we'll also have a couple of presentations on doing transition plans and taking your measurements and doing all the things that uh, would make you compliant if you're a local unit of government. So um, my email address and contact information is shown here on the slide. It's uh, dlz.com, first initial, last name. So S Metzer, no G, L, or N in Metzer. So, um, feel free to email me questions, photographs. Uh, I always like challenges. Uh, and if I can look at your situation and help you out fairly quickly, I'm more than happy to do that. So uh, if there are no other questions, comments, or anything else, I thank you again for attending and uh, have a great rest of your day and week. Thanks, everyone.